United States Olympic Committee. Development, Enhancement, and Sustainability of Expert Performance in Sport Conference, 2008. Tim Bowman, Ph.D., Untitled Lecture. This original lecture was about two hours long, and these are the audio notes. Bauman is an applied and cognitive psychologist and starts off the lecture by showing a short video clip, then asking questions about selling information to athletes, that is, right audience versus wrong audience, compatibility versus incompatibility. Sometimes it could be the right personality or the wrong personality, or the coach and the athlete could or couldn't work for a number of reasons regarding teaching, coaching, learning, approach, etc. Bowman suggests we are very different from all other creatures due to evolution. That is, brain growth and development of frontal lobe and neocortex in humans. Because of that brain growth and development, humans are king predators. This growth and development of brain comes with benefits and downfalls, and much of this lecture is about the benefits and downfalls of our brains. Safe versus threat. Bowman does another Q&A about safety and threat to the audience, and they respond with these answers regarding safety. Clothing, lights, exit signs, number of people there, or safety in numbers. Other examples, locks, fire alarms, airbags, shutter, glass, police, military, sport examples. Equipment, helmets, headgears, safety pits for pole varders and high jumpers. Bowman suggests the USA is a social system and safety definitely becomes an issue when things cost money, which alludes to many of the audience's answers. Survival. Two parts. Number one, physical threat. Number two, personal threat. Self-concept, the media, self-esteem, expectations, NGB, etc. For humans, the personal threat is as big as the physical threat of danger. Bowman suggests fear is largely a part of personal threats. Animals do not have this type of fear, although animals have physical threats. That is, danger of being killed or eaten or surviving. Some athletes can use negative imagery as a motivation or motivational tool or motivational productive tool, while others use negative imagery as an inhibitive unproductive tool. Each athlete is different. Personal threats create distress for some, which affects their performance negatively. The Olympics is a is so unique, Bowman says, you almost have to experience it because nothing else is like it. So I'm just going to review a couple of the concepts. One is when coaches are communicating and or teaching coaching athletes, they have to, in so many words or ideas, be compatible with the athlete and vice versa. Otherwise, the teaching and the instruction may not be absorbed or learned. And he makes the analogy where teaching and coaching is like selling it. Uh, information to athletes and as much as it could be the wrong approach, it could be the wrong coach, it could be the wrong student, just because you're a coach and they're a student athlete does not mean that it's going to work out and then there has to be other underlying uh, ideas in order to get your message across. Maybe the approach has to be different. Maybe you have to do a, a different style based on age and or gender. So there are a lot of different variables going into teaching and coaching. The, the crux of this particular discussion, though, is going to come from the safety uh, versus the threat and uh, the topics that we're really dealing with are fear and how to overcome fear and how to continue to deal with that type of adversity. The example that he uses is animals don't necessarily have the kind of personal fears that humans do because of our brain growth and development where animals essentially are just, you know, basically trying to eat and survive or not being eaten. Where humans have that kind of fear where, with safety issues and they have the fear of, you know, being afraid of something like these type of examples. How they view themselves, how the media views them, their self-esteem, their confidence levels, their expectations put on by the NGB or their parents or their friends or self-imposed expectations. Those are all kind of things that are not uh, going to be life or death, but athletes can make them to be life or death. So that way they actually create a barrier for success. 
Success versus winning means different things to different people. And depending on what winning and success means to you, each athlete, coaches will get a different reaction and response to performances. All of the information provided in this lecture also applies to coaches, support staff, etc. So everyone needs to be aware of what will work for each coach, athlete, and support staff. Three athlete performance categories. Number one, performance is same in training and competition. Number two, performance in competition goes down from training. That is, lose a gear. Number three, performance in competition increases from training. That is, gain a gear. Why does this happen? My answer is, each athlete is unique and interprets competitions differently. Audience answers. Stress and how each athlete manages stress. Bowman explains, if attention from parents is the reason why athletes are in sport, there may be huge problems to come. Some athletes love the experience of the competition, and competitions are very difficult to initiate or imitate. That is, crowd, officials, pressure, stress. Bowman suggests the variables that make some excel are the same variables that make some fail. Amygdala and the limbic system. Those are in the brain. Important piece of fear and the no threat. This is where all fear or no fear is processed. The limbic system is responsible for focus, confusion, meetings, etc. Bowman suggests a past performance at a venue can sometimes affect the athlete's minds and the next performance. Emotional stimulus. Emotional stimulus. People, smells, sounds, situations, and past experience can trigger the mind and affect performances. Sensory thalamus. Emotional stimulus is processed by the sensory thalamus and brain and goes directly to the fast path or the amygdala or the sensory cortex, then to the amygdala. <coughs> Excuse me. Fast path is like a reaction and humans either feel no threat or feel threatened. If athletes do not feel threatened, they perform well. When athletes feel threatened, they perform poorly. What are the fear responses? Number one, freezing. Hands, cold feet, tight muscles. Number two, running. Get away. First hit. Warmed up. Number three, faking it. Fake it till you make it. Look bigger. Muhammad Ali, and the uh, example with Muhammad Ali is he would uh, get himself so psyched up and he would psych other athletes out, making them believe that they were nothing and he was something, so he was faking, faking it in that sense. Number four, submitting, give up, just surviving, cowering, getting smaller. Number five, <clears throat> fighting, fight for survival. It's do or die, if still alive in game. Timing of responses. Stuck in one of the responses or moving through freeze to fight is critical for elite performances. Athletes can be taught to move through the responses more efficiently and control them or channel their energies. Athletes condition and precondition these responses again and again. Every competition and performance. Well, again, this, this uh, lecture is largely dealing with ways in which to uh, overcome adversity with regard to fear and the three athlete performance categories. I'm going to go over those again because I think those are really important and important in terms of there's you know there's probably variations on a theme, but essentially athletes perform the same way the same way that they do in competition. Athletes gain a gear from uh, training and or they lose a gear and the author and or Bowman is suggesting that these all have to do with how the athlete perceives the competition. They either get afraid of the competition or they get excited by it and they rise to the level of uh, the competition. The other idea is that uh, competitions are so much different than actual training that you know this could be the reasons why people either gain a gear or lose a gear. For some they lose a gear because it, it's just you know, it, there's so much pressure and stress involved with them that it, it makes them kind of freeze up and clam up. On the other hand, for some people, the ex the same exact variables make them increase because they place no uh, value on the training at all. But it, they become so excited and it's so fun for them to compete that they rise to a higher level. So those, are, again, are examples of the three different categories where some people perform the same as in training. They would be what you would call consistent. And then the other two are, are inconsistent from training to competition. And he goes on to suggest that there are 
parts of the brain that affect how quickly we can go from that basically flight and or fight syndrome. That's what I learned, man, probably 20 years ago in some type of psychology class. But the quicker we can go through those stages, and I'm going to read those off again, from freezing to running to faking it to submitting to fighting. Uh, the idea there is he was saying it takes some athletes a long time to go through those stages and some actually some athletes actually get caught in the freezing stage. When you're competing, you need to go immediately to the fighting stage. And that was a, a, a quick summary of that last uh, piece of information there. Stress barometer. Bowman has athletes create a ledger of stressors in their lives. Then has them rate them from 0 to 10. He then has them create another measure of how much this may be amplified by athletes. This stress barometer helps athlete and coach recognize stressors and effectively deal with them. Navy SEALs. Bowman says they perform on demand and are selected and trained to do so. About a third of Navy SEALs have college degrees, which suggests most humans could become Navy SEALs. A video has shown that demonstrates their athletic ability and mental skills plus endurance and decision making. Part of the video says Hell Week is a test of mental and physical motivation. I believe mental and physical motivation is the essence of success. Bowman said several Olympic summit athletes went through the Navy SEAL training and it changed their perspective and their reference points. Thus, they believe they could do better and believe more and be less fearful. John Wooden example. Bowman cites John Wooden as a coach who changed his thoughts about sports psychology. Wooden, who won 10 NCAA titles in 12 years, said he wouldn't know if his athletes were successful till 10 years after the championships. And also commented they must use the championship experience to help them build great people. Bowman goes on to say sports are also a way to build athletes along the way as a byproduct of building great people. He also says we, we can't lose sight of being profitable in terms of getting better getting better every time out as this is our job us being coaches pyramid of success bottom want it middle work top it's got to be worth it or wanting it want it or wanting it working it and bringing it picture pyramid from bottom to top where the bottom or base is the widest with the most athletes and the top is an arrow with the fewest athletes Bowman says this is what happens in most sports where it can take 10 years to be an expert. That is, some athletes drop out along the way and very few become experts. Very few become experts that want it, work it, and finally bring it. Then there are very few of those athletes who at the top actually can perform on demand. So I'll review that pyramid concept uh, first and I'll go backwards in terms of viewing some of the other material. And I think this happens in all areas of life. Generally in the start of anything you've got a lot of people that do it and the most successful in many avenues of life there are very few people at the top. If you just used any kind of sporting championship whatsoever generally there's a bracket and you could use that as the pyramid base as the bracket continues and then really if you turn a bracket upside down or on its side it looks just like a pyramid and that's the concept where you'll start off with a wide base of teams and or athletes and as you progress over the years uh, and through a tournament and through a season you'll ultimately end up with very few people actually at the top of the rank and or top of the tournament so the pyramid of success suggests that the ones that actually continue to work and want it the most and are in tune with how to get better in terms of they've got some type of coach that understands how to put them through the right training, training program they may likely uh, be able to get to the top of the pyramid I suggest that opportunity has a lot to do with it too where you can have you can want it as much as you want but if you don't have the right opportunities presented in front of you like a good coach and or good training facilities and or the resources to get you to the next level sometimes that you just wanting it and working hard and smart uh, may not necessarily be enough the giant 
Ryan Wooden example I think is important because for me it's not just about winning championships it's about changing people's lives giving them the 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 discipline to understand what respect means, how to exhibit respect, giving them the self-control to understand that adversity is actually going to happen, and this is what you do when adversity actually comes, giving them to ability to overcome any obstacle and or uh, road uh, bump or speed hump or anything that gets in their way. When we do that, I think we have properly prepared uh, our student-athletes for life. The Navy SEALs example, I like that one too because uh, similar to any type of intensive type of training camp, if you've never been to a, you know, an intensive type of training camp, I guess this may not necessarily be relevant, but if you have, you understand at the end of that training camp, it's like you're, you're a changed person. The Navy SEALs example to me is, is essentially just like an intensive type of training camp where before you go in, you're uncertain if you can do it and if you can actually make it through it. Now your perspective on, you know, what is a possible changes because you've done and seen things that maybe you didn't see and have done before. An example for me is when the times that I was working at the United States Olympic Education Center, we a couple of times we took our teams to Japan. And when we took those teams to Japan, they were doing all kind of exercises that were, you know, they were women doing the exercises. And a lot of times in, in, in our team, we would be training and they'd be like, we can't do it. When they saw those women doing those exercises, there was nothing that they could do. They couldn't say we can't do it because everybody else was doing it. So because they were in that type of intensive training environment, quickly they all, they all of a sudden started to believe that, well, if she can do it, so can I. And that's that example, I think, can be impressed on student athletes if athletes are placed in the right environment. Sometimes the coach has enough persuasive power to get the athletes to believe that anything is possible. And when that starts to happen, this is the beginning of high-performance training, in my opinion. Q&A. What about the difference between cutthroat athletes versus better, more gifted athletes? Bowman says, all athletes need to be taught appropriate sports psychology, sports-specific training, and more skills from the start. So when athletes have made it to expert level, they are highly trained and ready to perform on demand. Dramatic incidents. Bowman says some experiences can get stored in brain and be processed appropriately or used appropriately. He goes on to say traumatic incidents are not stored in brain appropriately or some way and are processed in or maladaptively. Bowman suggests during REM sleep, most people's experiences are processed in brain appropriately and they wake up refreshed. Performance blocks may be caused from traumatic incidents that are not processed appropriately by athletes. If athletes are thinking about traumatic incidents, their focus and motivation may be less than ideal. Bowman uses a system called EMDR that helps athletes process or deal with the traumatic incidents so they can focus and are optimally motivated. Trauma can affect everyone differently. That is, some may have performance blocks and some will be motivated, likely due to their change in perspective and or how they dealt with the trauma. So for me, that last portion, the Q&A section and or the summary, it suggests that we can teach athletes how to master and use appropriately psychological skills training. After I started studying uh, information from the United States Olympic Committee, dealing with nutrition, dealing with sports-specific training, dealing with sports psychology, I decided that all of those other things are important, but to me, psychological skills training became one of the most important because, to me, it does not matter if you know how to do the skill correctly. It does not matter if you have the right diet. It does not matter if you're the quickest, fastest, and strongest if you're afraid. Right. So so once I started to really understand that concept and really started to dig in deep into high performance training, I focused a lot of the theories and or thoughts and or ideas that I had on learning and mastering the, the very fundamental basics of sports psychology training. And then I instituted that into everything else I was doing. Of course, you need to know a ton about nutrition and you need to know about high performance training with periodization and recovery and tapering. All those concepts need to be understood. And for me, I think the icing on the cake in which gets athletes over the hump sooner than later is the base of psychological skills training. That 
is the key that turns the car on, if you like to use that analogy. That is the the energy that makes everything else uh, uh, happen. In other words, without that energy, it doesn't matter what you have. That's kind of my belief system. And again, I'm suggesting that you may come up with your own philosophy, but I was able to come up with that type of philosophy after I did, you know, six or seven years of what I like to call robust research and studying at the United States Olympic Education Center.